to our first of the year meeting, a geek on market update meeting. Um, glad you are here and we are here again this year. Um, we are going to have today three, three, three speakers today. John Robinson is going first going to talk about cotton markets. Um, Justin Menavides going to talk about grains. And last, David Anderson is going to talk about uh, livestock. So, John, if you want to start, let me share your slides. All right. Well, ha Happy New Year, everybody. I'm going to talk, give a brief summary of, uh, of the cotton market situation. And if, go ahead and flip when you put it in show mode, flip to the second. Uh, slide, Poncho. So, as you know, as everybody knows, it's been uh, a wild ride going back through the last year, which this slide shows, and even going further back than that, in both the new crop and the old crop markets. And I would, uh, I would uh, summarize the the reasons, the influences. The market has shifted back and forth between fears about weak demand and fears about tight supplies, and I think that's going to continue into 23 go ahead and flip it uh, the traditional um, numerical uh, supply and demand summary way of looking at cotton supply and demand is shown in these columns here and if you look at the last column that's the supply and demand numbers for the 22 crop uh, we have these numbers as of a week or so ago from usda and what i've got bracketed is a comparison of the kind of the production, the supply part of it, which is what we start off the year with, and then uh, the projected 14.6 million bale crop that USDA kind of surprised everybody with. And I'll just say there's been a lot of, everybody has expected USDA to whittle down the production number and they've been adding to it much to the confusion and, and uh, disbelief of folks. Uh, that number's been getting bigger, which would, add to ending stocks and generally weaken prices. It may explain why we're why we've been stuck in this low to mid 80s range for a while is that on the production side, USDA has not done the bullish thing that everybody expects them to do. And uh, then down there on the other end, what's bracketed is uh, domestic use is 2.2 million bales and 12 million bales of exports. That's that's our domestic you know that's what we're doing with our cotton and usda has been cutting that number they've been cutting the export number because until recently the export data have been pretty weak pretty pretty poor week by week we get export sales data and at low prices we ought to be selling a lot more cotton than we have been and because of that poor trend usda has been cutting that number which is also a bearish thing and would add to the add to the bottom line the ending stocks both of those things would increase ending stocks and and weaken prices or at least take away the take away the reason for prices to go any higher um these these two effects are are have led to a ending stocks guesstimate at the moment of 4.2 million bales which while not burdensome it's higher than the previous years and again i think that's why we're kind of stuck in this 80 something cent range um now i do think that Next month, when USDA comes out with these numbers, they're going to have to reconcile that 14.68 million bale crop estimate against a Jennings estimate, which is a lot lower, and a uh, Classings estimate, which is a lot lower. All these estimates come from different parts of USDA. I think that's kind of funny. One, one group of USDA says the crop size is this, based on Classing or Jennings, and another group says that the crop size is what's shown on this chart. I, I, the numbers are going to come together. I think the, I think the uh, production number is actually going to get lowered, lowered more than the Jennings and Classings are going to get raised. So we may, along the short is, we may have a, we may have a half a million bale cut in the production number next, next week, or not next week, next month. Uh, when that happens, I don't think there's going to be a huge rally as a result of it, because the market's been expecting this for five months. They've been expecting a cut a big cut in the USDA production guesstimate. And uh, when they finally get it, I think they'll breathe the sigh of relief. But I think people are going to be disappointed if they think that they're going to get a five or 10 cent rally out of this. I just don't see that. I may be wrong and I hope I am. Uh, but in the old crop, I think we're kind of stuck pretty much with where we are 
you know, we've climbed to the mid 80s. Maybe we'll go a few pennies higher. But I think the old crop market, because of the slow demand and because of the expected cut in production, I, I think we're pretty much getting what we're getting. Flip it one more time, Poncho, and let's think about the new crop situation is is under the same influence of tight some uncertainty about the supply and tight supplies and tight production, as well as uncertainty about whether demand will recover. So it's really the same story, a tug of war between uncertain supply and production and uncertain demand. Um, the supply side uncertainty starts with a question of what the acreage is going to be. Uh, relative prices would predict that historically we ought to be only planting 9 million acres, and that's what I've got penciled in here, 9 million planted, 15% abandonment gives us 7 point something million harvested, an average yield results in a you know a fairly low level of production. Now, I'll tell you, there are people out there that are expecting uh, 10 and a half million planted and 11 million planted, uh, so we'll have to watch real closely what comes out in the in the farmer surveys, the big farmer surveys that everybody watches, like the one the Cotton Council is going to do. They release that February 12th. And USDA is going to release two acres reports on March 31 and on June the 30th. And the market will be anticipating them, watching them, buzzing about them and reacting to them. So if it's if the planted number is this tight and as Pancho mentioned, it's dry, which it is, you know, we could have a really, really tight supply situation. We could wind up with less than 3 million bales of ending stocks. And that, you know, that could justify at harvest time, that could justify 80 something cent futures. And during, during, this is the most important part, during the growing season, when it's uncertain, when all these questions are uncertain about the number of acres planted and the state of the crop, and the average yield and what the abandonment is, that's our best chance. This market is going to go into weather market mode and it's going to run up to the mid 90s easily. So the best prices of the year are probably going to be during the uncertainty about the crop size. And that'll be in May, June, July and August. We might have 95 cent futures then, but they may not last. Uh, it'll be something that people have to forward contract or reach out and grab with hedging. And the last bit of uncertainty is, again, is related to the the number of exports, I've got 12 million penciled in here, but you know there are people out there that are, you know, reasonably pointing out that there are signs of demand recovery. It has a couple of good export sales reports in the last week or two, if that continues, and if China, you know, indeed softens their COVID policy and their economy opens up again and begins to recover, and there's other signs of economic recovery, well then. That 12 million may be way too underestimated. And so if we if we export more, if the demand side is more, that'll that'll whittle down the ending stocks number. It could get really, really tight and prices could go to the 90s, maybe go back over a dollar. On the other hand, if we plant. If we plant 11 million acres and we have a decent sized crop and demand remains a little bit weak, uh, we could have ending stocks at four, four plus, even five. And that would be a real damper. That'd be a real damper. So there's a lot of room to swing here and uh, we'll just have to see how it unfolds. And uh, that's that's the remarks I have, Poncho. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. If any, I'm gonna have to get off the call and go take care of some other business. So if anybody's got remaining questions, my uh, go ahead and flip it, Poncho. My contact info is at the end. One more. Oh, sorry. But it don't matter. Anyway, people can get a hold of me on my cell phone or send me an email and we can we can talk about it more. Thanks a lot. Hey, anyone has any questions for John? Donna is still there. Okay. Justin. Yes, sir. Do you want to start your, your slides? Yes. Your presentation? Give me a second. Thank you, Justin. Yep. Uh, are you seeing my slides? Sorry, no. Okay, give me one second. How about now? Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. 
All right, well, thank you all for having me. Uh, I think mo normally, obviously, y'all will be hearing from Dr. Welch. He's unable to join us this morning, but we're going to briefly touch on uh, some of the things that have been impacting the grain market. So over the last um, uh, month, probably since the last time uh, y'all spoke, um, these are very similar, I think, in form to what y'all have been seeing for, for basically uh, the last three or four months uh, of the outlook. You know, um, where we begin here with cash prices on the Texas High Plains, um, as we moved through the end of, of the marketing year, um, we had a lot of um, uh, kind of outsized events like the derecho, the Brazilian drought, Chinese feed grade demand that were slowly incrementally increasing the, the price of grain as we moved into the beginning of 2021. The Russian invasion of Ukraine really uh, injected a lot of uncertainty and uncertainty into the market where we saw grain prices spike essentially overnight. And they've remained largely uh, a step above, you know, basically in that one to two dollar range, higher than where they were prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The wheat um, at a certain point was significantly higher. Um, they've all fallen back a little bit, and there's some some things we'll talk about here the rest of the presentation that that show us why those prices have fallen a little ways. The key here, in particular, when we think about corn, uh, the updated WASDE values, and when when we look at uh, the most recent data that came out last week, um, there was a revision downward in the, the demand side. So we had some revision downward in supply as well. But um, the reality was that that um, domestically, at least, we had a significant revision downward in demand. And that was a result largely of a change in exports. So it was the WASDE incorporated uh, shipments from November and December into that January report. We had uh, I think some of the lowest uh, export shipments since I believe it was 2019, um, whenever we look at exports for that that marketing month. And so that pressure downward uh, really um, kind of hurt uh, demand in terms of its final value there when you look at um, the, the demand and supply balance sheet um, on the exports in particular. Uh, when we move on, we kind of look at how that has changed throughout the last several WASDs. We begin there in May with uh, uh, total use circled there in red, and you can see that over time total use has incrementally fallen a little further with each successive WASD report, with the net change being uh, about a loss and roughly half a percent in total use over the period. Now, that's not a huge change in terms of the total use, um, but it is a revision downward, certainly, and some of the pressure downward um, is, is also going to be felt depending on how demand activity continues as we move through the remainder of this old crop year. We think back to production, this graphic has not changed since the last time you guys would have uh, been through this presentation. Essentially, production is down year to year, but a lot of this, uh, this pricing rationing is going to depend on what the balance is of the change in demand and the change in supply. So we look at total production of corn obviously down significantly year to year. Um, and even if you look at that blue bar of the United States production, there was a relatively large change in production year to year from that 2020 and 2021 crop year into this 22-23 crop year. So thinking about those, those supply and demand uh, reductions year to year balancing out, we want to think about a little more on the demand side, what could change demand. Uh, when we look at GDP or the economic growth um, in three different kinds of economies, but we think primarily, you know, as a food stuff for our for our coarse grains, and then also, excuse me, feed grains on the coarse grain side, and then food grain for wheat, uh, what we see impact demand for our um, coarse grains and for wheat is really um, any sort of damage to uh, income in developing countries can really hinder um, some of that. In increased consumption in, in grain as we see grain as a feedstuff largely, right? So some of the exports, or a lot of the exports, um, particularly we think back to China, uh, were in terms of building feed demand. So as the developing world grows, um, it demands uh, more food, but also a different kind of, of food um, and transitioning more to proteins like pork, beef, and chicken. And so that was grains that we export used in feed. As incomes fall and people are able to afford less of that protein in their diet um, in those developing countries, we can see some pressure downward in terms of, of uh, grain demand here in the United States. So we want to think kind of critically about what's going to happen in the global economy over the next six months to two years 
with lots of forecasts of recession, right? So when we look at interest rates and inflation, uh, most of what has been pressuring the economy, we do think to, you know, the economic story of the last year has been inflation. And then in response to that inflation, the change in interest rates, what we have mapped here, you know, the red line is the CPI. So it's a good measure of price changes in comparative months. So if we were to look at this graphic, um, and we look here in June of 22, what this says is that um, the basket of goods measured by the CPI is 9% higher in June of 22 than it was in June of 21. And we can see that inflation has certainly fallen. That has largely been, you know, we think in response to increases in interest rates, um, but it is still high. So the target rate of inflation for the Fed is 2%, though I did just see a report this morning that the Fed is considering revising their inflation target. I didn't catch the number, um, but until today, until explicitly today, um, the Fed was standing pretty firm on 2% being their target. The question is, as they increase these interest rates, are they gonna be able to manage the reduction in inflation and those increase in interest rates without really um, injecting a really strong recession? Right, so they're looking for that idea of a soft landing, which I think is pretty hard to pull off. Um, but if we see this change in interest rates really create a strong recession, not only in the United States, but globally, we can see that begin to impact our grain demand. If you look here, I've already kind of highlighted this point, but um, income and grain use are tied very tightly together ever since the early 2000s. So that's income per capita in developing countries. And then we've got grain use per capita. And so when we think about over time, what has happened here, um, we've got uh, China moving out of kind of the, the, the darkest and poorest, it's, its middle class really grew out of being a global economic um, sector that was very poor and moved into the middle class. That really began to take hold through the 90s. And then when we look here into the mid two or the early 2000s, that relationship solidified. Uh, China began to grow its middle class those two relationships were very tightly coupled. We had some instances of short crops that really uh, broke those relationships apart. But in general, when we see a decline in income long-term, we might see some pressure downward on prices. Um, so 2023 recession would hit countries relatively hard. Um, the, the question in my mind is becoming more and more ec the economic health of China long-term with them reporting some pretty uh, severe losses in terms of their annual GDP growth and a you know reduction in population of I think 840,000 people. These are both kind of the first time they've admitted to some pretty severe uh, economic headwinds. And the, the reality is that though that is China, what China is reporting, it's very likely that they are under reporting the severity as, they, as it seems they tend to do with negative news. So when we think about China specifically, and it's tied to grain demand, this is Chinese feed grain imports, not just from the United States, but from countries around the world. You can see we moved through about 20 million metric tons, roughly bounced around that number for the last decade, uh, moved much higher in terms of their grain demand. A lot of that was in response to uh, trying to regrow their hog herd exports, or excuse me, Chinese feed grain imports roughly tripled. It was really supportive of our sorghum market through 21 and 22. Um, as we move through that 22 to 23 crop, you can see that um, imports of feed grains have successively declined and we lost a lot of strength in their sorghum imports. Um, as China begins to demand less feed grain and as they potentially face a recession like the rest of us, this will be critically important to see what does their, their export, excuse me, their import market look like. And if they really lower their total imports, we can see pressure downward on prices through the remainder of this old crop marketing season and into the new crop production season. And you might think if they're not importing from the United States, why does it matter? There's this kind of uh, thought thought process you could go through that really demand anywhere for a product like this, a pretty homogenous commodity is really good for suppliers everywhere, right? So if China changes their sourcing from United States to somewhere like Argentina, um, Argentina's traditional customers would then be searching for a new source and they might turn to the United States. So really, even if China's not importing directly from the United States, which they are, a, you know, they have been trading, particularly in sorghum uh, with us, um, even if they're not importing directly from us, though, uh, they're going to be critically important in terms of total global demand.
That brings us to this critical measure of days of use on hand. We leave China out in terms of world and world less China, excuse me, world less China and U.S. corn. We think here to 40 days of use being that critical principle in corn. When we get below 40 days of use on hand, there's kind of some difficulty getting corn from where it's stored and grown to where it needs to be. And so we begin to see really uh, kind of stepwise jumps up in prices um, that lead us to things like biofuel era pricing levels. So when we combine all those supply and demand factors and look here to the um, uh, balance sheet, basically long-term projections, you can see that in general, all supply metrics appear for the upcoming crop year in particular. So the, the planting season we're facing to look up, right? So higher corn price through 2022, higher wheat price, both indicate higher acres of both. We see higher acreage chasing those higher prices. That means we can expect production to be up, both planted and harvested acres. Um, we look at production in general being increased over the next year. That increases our total supply, which would bring us then to an increase in days on hand at the end of the marketing year above that 40 level, though still relatively tight. You know, if we see some, uh, this is a pretty big jump in yield, though it does bring us back into line with trend line. If we face any challenges here in terms of, you know, poor subsoil moisture, poor um, moisture in the Midwest as this La Nina, El Nino begins to kind of uh, switch back and forth and we move through the summer, uh, any challenges to yield could pressure that overall production number downward. We're relatively close to 40. You know, I think 42 is still relatively tight, um, but it is above that 40 level. And so when we think looking at that price relationship, what are some of the things we can expect? Keeping that 40 days of use on hand very uh, front of mind. You can see here that uh, price in 22 uh, in the in the uh, marketing year for 22, uh, only about 34 days of use on hand. At the end of the marketing year, we saw prices for the season average up here near the $7 level. Think back to the biofuel era, 10, 11, 12, 13, significantly higher prices than when we were above 40 days of use on hand. So that idea, we're going to be right here around 40 days of use on hand, which would mean that that trend line, that relationship between the two should keep us somewhere here closer to maybe, you know, a little bit below what we've been seeing through 21 and 22, back between four and five dollars a bushel, um, though the WASD has us higher. So it'll be interesting to see how that relationship trends and, and really what production does over the next uh, couple of months. So keep in mind, just takeaways, high input costs are going to pressure those margins, even though we have relatively strong prices um, for this year and even the upcoming production year, WASD still forecasts prices um, above where we saw prior to the pandemic, but corn acres up with trend yield, which is up from our historic yield a year ago. Uh, U.S. corn stocks to use ratio and that days of use on hand increasing at the end of the year. This all indicates that prices would, you know, fall through the remainder of this marketing year and into um, next year's production. In terms of marketing, thinking about indicators of recession, although this for me gets a little more dicey because in some cases when we see a recession in equities, you know, there's a tendency by some investors to move their their money out of equities and into commodities. So I think the volatility just in the general economy for those who aren't even watching ag could lead to some short term marketing opportunities for those of us in the ag sector. So watch those weather reports, watch those economic indicators. I will also say, and Poncho, this might actually be better for you to take over and talk about briefly. I'll run the slides, but um, Poncho there in Vernon is going to be running the online master marketer course. And Poncho, I'll let you talk about that. I think you're muted, Poncho. Great. Can you all hear me now? Perfect. So this year we made a few changes and we're going to have Master Marketer. It's going to be online. Uh, it's going to be free. So you want to share this information. Everybody can sign in. If you all want to participate, you know, um, let me know if you don't have the link. I will send you the link. But basically session one is going to be leveling. We have session two and then we're going to have another seven sessions talking about different type of markets, outlooks, um, marketing plans, uh, how the future markets works, puts, inputs, budgets, and we're trying to cover, you know, everything we cover on Master Marketer, but it's going to be online. So if you want to share that information, 
uh, let me know and I will send you send you the link. OK. Justin. You want us to share that with our buyers? Oh. Sorry, Daniela, I could not oh. hear you. Do you want us to share that with our buyers? Oh. The link for the master lesson. Let, let's do something. I, I cannot hear you, but what I will do is when I send you the link of the YouTube video, when we post the video, on the, the link on the video, I will send you the information and the link about Master Marketer for everyone. Is that okay? So, you'll have any questions for Justin? Yes, you can send everything out to your growers. Yes, exactly. Hey. Justin, uh, uh, sorry, uh, if no questions for Justin, David, are you ready? For your presentation? I'm ready. I'm okay. ready. Let's... Do you want to put your slides on? Well, or no slides theory, today? No, we'll have some. Maybe. What no? <laughs> Poncho, can you see this thing? There we go. A little bit of lag in it. Um, Excellent. Thank you. You know, every time I get on here, it tries to make me update the stuff right in the middle. So I was getting trying to get that box off cleared off of there that wanted me to start the update. So anyway, heck, it's good to be with you all today. Um, I have gotten more calls in the last couple of weeks than in my entire career about eggs. And, you know, as I tell people, I am, uh, you know, if you want to talk to somebody about how to keep them alive or how long they live or uh, stuff like that, yeah, I'm not your guy, but I can certainly talk about production and prices, how much we're producing, what prices are. So I've done a ton of interviews. So I thought I thought what I'd do here is just pull together real quick a couple of charts to kind of put some of the egg stuff in context because it might, you know, hopefully it might be useful to you all. So what I did was I took USDA's data for the number of table egg layers, chickens laying eggs. I just arbitrarily grabbed the data back to 2008. I keep a spreadsheet of it that goes back a lot further. Um, and, I, and I thought it would be worth highlighting a couple of things in this. One is, you know, we've had a pretty significant upward trend in uh, not only the number of layers, but the number of eggs, which is going to be my next chart. Uh, a, an increasing trend of, of egg use, consumption, um, and production over time. Uh, I want to call out a couple other things out of this data. If you look at this, this large decline right in the middle of the data, which is 2015, that was our last uh, big outbreak of high pathogenic avian influenza. So when I'm asked about, okay, what's the, why are egg prices record high? In fact, uh, last month in the uh, CPI data, the consumer price index data, the, the December average egg price, I got to look over here at my notes, was $4.25 a dozen compared to a buck seventy nine the December of the year before. So we've got this huge increase in egg prices that I think everybody has noticed. You know, key number one is high pathogenic avian influenza. Uh, this decline you see really over the last year, uh, really highlights that impact. We went from uh, December of 21, we had about 327 million, 329 million. Let me look at my notes, 327 million egg laying chickens. By June, we had dropped to 299 million. And it's really high pathogenic avian influenza. We've had some buildup in numbers since then, getting to about 306 million. Uh, but you know, the last big outbreak was in 2015. This outbreak in terms of all poultry has actually killed more birds uh, with the biggest impact in egg layers and turkeys. So, uh, you know, that's the big deal is high pathogenic avian influenza. Now, 
I would also argue that uh, we've had some other things going on. You know, egg prices would have been higher this year than last year, even if avian influenza had not happened. And it's really because of, you know, think of all the costs that are higher of getting it from where they're produced to where we consume them at the store, at the restaurant, uh, but also high feed costs. So as as Justin and Mark Welch have talked on these things, certainly looking at at higher corn and soybean meal prices uh, compared to three or four years ago, compared to a five year average, we have much higher feed costs today. So this general decline, really from nineteen from twenty nineteen. Uh, through today in terms of, of egg layers is really related to a longer term trend of, of, of really a couple of things. Higher feed costs that have cut profitability and led, led companies to reduce production. Uh, the second thing is just the turmoil of the pandemic. The, all the shifting from away from restaurants to grocery stores and that uh, turmoil, those rippling effects of that back and forth just simply as we shift use uh, between all of these uh, these two basic outlets of restaurants and grocery stores, uh, certainly cut profitability and led to some declining production as well. Uh, so we we throw you know this longer term this idea of the pandemic, the human pandemic, higher feed costs, higher costs of of production and transportation. Uh, and now avian influenza all acting at the same time have led this sharp reduction again in the number of chickens. With this backdrop of this long-term growth in, in consumption uh, of production. Um, uh, so anyway, I, I thought this might be useful to put some of this data in context. You all may be getting questions about it. It may help. Uh, the next chart I did was put together the number of table eggs that are produced from those layers. Uh, this is in millions, so you know my scale goes from five billion to nine billion uh, eggs. Uh, that's a hell of a lot of eggs. <laughs> uh, but if you you know what I find interesting in this data again, this trend, this longer term trend of increasing production, but highly seasonal production as well. Uh, those peaks and valleys that we see within the year, the effects of the of HPAI in 2015. The effects that we've had over the last year or so of, of high path avian influenza again, uh, and some attempt to rebuild production, uh, and and we do have that increasing slow increase in the number of of eggs being produced and egg laying chickens. Uh, you know what I might argue is what we have going on now is really two steps forward and one back, trying to rebuild uh, production in response to profits. Yet as we're rebuilding chicken numbers, you know, the 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 disease hits another farm and we lose a whole bunch more chickens. And, and so it's really this building and pulling back due to the disease. Uh, but again, profits driving increased production. I've been asked a lot about, um, well, where are we headed for prices? And, and I would likely argue that prices still have a ways to go up. Uh, recently, we've had wholesale prices higher than retail prices. So as some of those contracts reset at, at stores, we'll likely see higher prices. Uh, we also have a really holiday seasonal demand for eggs. You know, you might think in the fall, we certainly have holiday driven baking needs and things like that, but we're getting pretty close to Easter egg hunts. And if we look back in other past times of, of, uh, when are prices often their highest? They're often highest around Easter because of those fresh table egg demand for Easter egg hunts. So that's still ahead. Uh, but, you know, so there's some pressure for some higher prices, yet also I would argue prices work. It, it causes producers to produce more and consumers to buy less. And so we've really got this tug of war of the timing of when that stuff happens and, and when we get back to the number of chickens and egg production that we had prior to HPAI, I, you know, I think, you know, later in 2023, I expect we'll see chicken numbers grow, egg production grow, but it's still going to take a good while to get that production back to those levels. So hopefully that's useful. Uh, you know, you can't hardly turn on the computer or open the newspaper without seeing an article about eggs. So I thought this might be useful. Uh, 
on the cattle side, you know, USDA's cattle on feed report was released Friday afternoon. Uh, placements in December were down about 8% from the year before. So uh, a pretty sharp reduction in placements. I, I thought we might have a little bit lower placements than that. Uh, but 8% is a, a, a fairly large decline in placements. Again, for about the fourth month, uh, placements had been below a year ago. Uh, heck, I would argue, you know, we've sort of uh, run out of placeable cattle, finally, that the that placements are starting to mimic what we see uh, in, you know, smaller cow herd, fewer cows, fewer calves. Placements are starting to reflect that. Marketings were certainly lower. The, those cattle going to slaughter were certainly smaller. Uh, you know, I might largely, you know, largely expect you know, declining replacements a few months ago showing up in marketings. Uh, yet we also had some winter storms that may have affected that as well. And you throw in some holidays, and and uh, we had smaller marketings, and and that's going to reflect, I think, the coming trend over the next couple of years is fewer cattle, fewer cattle going to packing plants and less beef production. And the last bit I'd, uh, well, next to last bit I'd point out in terms of the cattle on feed report is for January 1, uh, cattle on feed are below a year ago. You know, I expect that to go on throughout this year and into next year with declining numbers of cattle on feed uh, as we have fewer, uh, fewer animals to place, fewer animals to put on feed. So again, we're We've made the turn, I would argue, in terms of declining numbers because of declining overall cattle numbers. Um, if we pull one other, I think, interesting piece out of the out of the report, it's the number of heifers on feed. And in this case, I've shown this as a percent of the total cattle on feed. So cattle on feed were down about just over three percent in uh, January one versus January one of a year ago. Uh, number of steers are down four and a half percent. The number of heifers are down half a percent. So we've actually seen uh, in the raw numbers fewer heifers on feed than a year ago for the first time in, in quite a while. Uh, we have fewer heifers to place. We're placing fewer of them, even though the, them, the heifers as a percent of total on feed numbers actually grew a little bit. It is a small decline in, in the absolute number of heifers on feed. Uh, you know, I don't think that is a is indicative of a uh, uh, holding back more heifers. I think it's more indicative of, you know, we've placed so many already. There aren't that many left to place. So again, you know, still a large supply of the number of cattle on feed are heifers. So I think that's kind of interesting in the report. I'll give you a, a little preview of the of USDA's inventory report. Uh, that thing will be released on January 31st, so next Tuesday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, Central Time, USDA's inventory report will come out. Uh, the red line on this chart are number of beef cows. My expectation for that report nationally is we're going to see a, a greater than 4% decline in the number of cows year over year. So January 1 of this year compared to January 1 of last year. 4% is a big number. You got to go back to the 80s and the 70s to get that big a number of annual decline. But, you know, given the number of cows that have gone to market uh, in 2022, the uh, fewer number of heifers indicated to be have been held back for replacement, uh, certainly drought, uh, higher costs relative to calf prices, all lead us to, you know, why have we called so many cows? That's a bunch of good reasons, both drought and economic reasons. I think it's going to, you know, it'll show up in this inventory report with fewer, uh, certainly fewer cows uh, in that report. So that's something I'll be looking for. Uh, all the state by state breakdowns bit will be in there, but that kind of national beef cow number is certainly the first thing I'm going to turn to when that report comes out. So you might watch for that. Uh, in, uh, early next week. And one last just price chart. I just took uh, 550 pound number one steers, Southern Plains, this big run up in prices. And, and whether I'd have shown lighter weight calves or heavier calves, this big run up in prices late in 2022. We're certainly starting out uh, well above where we were a year ago. Uh, 
but you know, largely driven, I think, by you know fewer numbers of these calves for sale. I think a little more wheat pasture demand as we had enough growth for some forage use, uh, pulled some animals that way, uh, but really, you know, higher prices. And if, if I showed you my price outlook for the next two years, I got higher prices this year and next year uh, as tighter supplies uh, take hold in the market. So that's my last uh, slide. I'm gonna try to end this show and get out of this, uh, maybe. Oh, hell. There we go. Stop sharing. That's the button I was looking for. Poncho, did I stop sharing? Yes, you did. Ah, Thank you very much. Right. Hey, I have here a comment <laughs> on the chat. Yeah, anybody got any questions on that stuff? There was one here. He says, here on the says, says, I might have missed you saying this, but what is the cost of that annual recurring dip in the graph for X? you know, that seasonal annual, you know, production. Oh, in eggs? December, March. Yes, on eggs, you know, there was yeah, really that, seasonal. Is that just humans causing that same dip every single year? Oh, you know, a bunch of it is, uh, that's a good question. Uh, and this is going to tax my knowledge of egg production. <laughs> but we have a couple of things going on. One is just the seasonality of egg production. Uh, and, and that's just biology and chickens. So from a supply standpoint, we have that going on. Some of that volatility, if you think about it, um, chickens, you know, if, if they're going to lay an egg every day, some, you know, we go from 28 days in February to 31 days in January. And, and so the number of days in the month affects mm -hmm. some of that production as well. Mm -hmm. But certainly kind of matching total production to holiday demand, you know, whether it's Easter egg hunts, whether it's in the fall and baking, uh, and then kind of that biology of the chickens contributes that seasonality we see. So all of those are part of that. That's a pretty reliable dip that only varied within three month period. That's quite interesting. Thank you. It's a pretty interesting seasonal pattern to production. Yeah. And yeah. and quite honestly, before I started digging into this, I I did not realize it was that big. Yeah, uh, it's huge. That, that big of a thing, and 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 I, you know, I did sort of shrink my scale too, so we could see it a little better. But you know, that within the year seasonality is pretty darn interesting and pretty regular, and you know, biology is a big part of that. Thank you. That's a good question. I found this data to be pretty fascinating. I uh, I, I read a lot. Mm -hmm. I try to keep up with the market, but I don't spend all my time on it. But I've certainly dug in a little harder in the last little bit, just in response to more questions. David, we have another question in the chat. Is is asking if if that production is that goes down is is caused a little bit by the cold or not? By basically, it's the weather. You know, I I don't know. Is it is it cold weather, wintertime stuff, or is it heat related in the summer? Or you know, chickens are you know, daylight hours and sunlight, you know, driven too, in terms sure. of like broiler production. I don't know how that affects egg production as well. Uh, and, and, you know, they go, they have a productive life and then you got to go through and molt them if you're going to keep them and do a bunch of other stuff. So I don't know how much is cold and heat relative to daylight hours. So maybe we all kind of curious as well because your graph has the dip occurring either after December or after February or after March. So that just kind of says, hey, it may not really be weather because the dip is not just occurring based on the weather. Right. It right. varies in that springtime period. So right. I, I don't know. That's cool. Uh, it, it's a good question. And, and I'm glad you observed that, Danielle. You may observe that in yours and I. You know, I don't know what is uh, day length, you know, number of light hours versus dark hours. And I think, you know, there's, that goes on in other kinds of chicken production where they try to keep the lights on longer and fool them. You know? <laughs> so uh, that's where that's where we need a real chicken growing person. I think <laughs> or a, one of our poultry science guys, not just this, uh, uh, <laughs> this economist, you know. <laughs> 
What do you do? Yell at your chickens to make them give more eggs? <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to play soothing music. That's what <laughs> Halloween costumes. Yeah. <laughs> Scare them into it. <laughs> Any more questions for David or Justin? Well, if not, I'll stop recording. Hey, thank you everyone very much. We will see you next month um, and hope you had and hope you will have a great 2023. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you all.